afternoon, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Joelle Kuzam, Partner and Employment Practice Group Chair at Bricker Neckler, and on behalf of the entire Board of Trustees of CMC, it's my pleasure to be here with you today to welcome our new members, our sponsors, and our fabulous panel. Let's take a moment to thank today's forum partner, the Matriots. We would also like to thank the beautiful Grange Insurance Audubon Center for its ongoing support and for hosting us. And thank you as well to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream. Let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. And now for today's main event, Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor. Chief Justice O'Connor completed her term on Ohio's Supreme Court just one month ago. Uh, she, her biographical information is in your flyer and you'll hear more about it during the course of our time together. Her time on the court ended in the middle of Ohio's historic battle over gerrymandered electoral districts. Justice O'Connor has served in statewide offices since 1998 and is Ohio's longest serving statewide elected woman. And now please welcome today's speakers, Justice Maureen O'Connor, retired Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and our host, Yvette McGee-Brown, currently a partner with Jones Day, and former Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. Justice McGee-Brown, we look forward to today's conversation. So you know how they say life has all kind of unexpected pleasures. You know, never did I imagine when I was appointed to the Supreme Court that I would get uh, Maureen out of the deal. She was the best part of it. Um, and so, you know. Likewise. <laughs> People often are like, they, they got so upset our parties when we were friends. Like, you cannot imagine how one picture of us together on the Columbus Dispatch created the most huge uproar in the state Democratic and state Republican parties. Well, Yvette, we were hugging. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we're going to start from the beginning. So a lot of you, you only know her as Chief Justice. And I will tell you that when I first met her, I was a bit scared of her too. And the reputation is, is well deserved. <laughs> but, but let's start from the beginning, because I often hear parents talk about how to raise strong girls. Uh, and you are an example of that. You're one of eight kids, uh, six girls, two boys. You're the second oldest. Um, how did little Maureen end up as the longest serving woman in Ohio politics and the Chief Justice of our highest court? That is a very good question. <laughs> I don't know that I have an answer, except for the fact that I was raised to think uh, and believe that I could do anything that I wanted to do. Uh, my parents were both uh, educated, uh, college educated. Uh, my grandparents, all four uh, grandparents, uh, were college educated. Uh, so education was the focus, and there was no way that you were going to quit school at, after high school, that's for sure. I was, I was, I think I was heartbroken when I heard my dad talk about where we were going to go to college, because I had no intention of going to college when I was in the fourth grade. <laughs> I was, it, I couldn't believe that that's, uh, we were going to have to go to college. But anyway, um, so it, education. And I went to a single sex uh, high school and college. Uh, it was an all women's N Nazareth Academy in Parma uh, Heights, Ohio. And I also then went to Seton Hill College in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I was um, a leader. In, in uh, those schools, I was editor of the yearbook and, and uh, you know, chair of all kinds of committees in high school. Uh, I was class president uh, freshman year in college. And so it was just something, I, I like to say, I gravitate towards positions where I think I can, you know, use my talents, that, that I could do something. Um, and. There's, I've never come against or come up against a, a problem that I didn't think I could solve. You know, I want to solve all kinds of problems, even problems that I have no business, you know, <laughs> being involved in. But that that is, you know, in my nature. It, it's and not just you know what you would think I would encounter in my career in my professional career. Career, um, you know, I give people advice and try and help them, even if they're strangers. But, <laughs> 
their, their, their mistake is, is asking me something. <laughs> So as a plug for Columbus School for Girls, how much do you think going to a single sex, you know, uh, secondary school helped you to develop the leadership skills that you have? Oh, I think it was uh, a combination. It, it definitely it was a combination because, you know, I went to high school with girls who were very timid and, and uh, would never, um, you know, speak up. They hardly even answered uh, things in, in uh, class. We were taught mainly by uh, Sisters uh, St. Joseph. Um, who, by the way, were so educated themselves and so encouraging of uh, in leadership in women and the sciences, you know, and um, uh, well, current events. I took international, uh, you know, uh, events, um, government. It was it, it, the curriculum was geared towards leadership, and, and I reflect on that. I don't know that I appreciated that or identified that, when, but in reflection, that is exactly what um, my high school did for me. And the Sisters of St. Joseph, you know, I will give them, I just, there were some wonderful, wonderful women uh, that I bonded with as, uh, you know, a high school uh, kid. And then, you know, going on to college and all of the nuns that I that taught it at, and they weren't all nuns there were a lot of lay faculty as they say um, but everybody was you know had their masters had their PhD and these were I mean, I'm talking about the nuns and you know that is kind of a, maybe a misconception about how educated they are in and it was and and quite frankly my great aunt went to Seton Hill and my mother went there, and my aunt went there, and my older sister went there. So you know there was no choice. But my Your my gave you choice. He told you. Oh yeah, okay. I could live at home and go to any college, Catholic college in uh, oh, um, Cleveland, uh, or I could go to Seton Hill, which was like two and a half, three hours away. What do you think I picked? So. <laughs> uh, but but my I'm talking about my great aunt, uh, Sister Mary Charles, Ursula Nunn, went to Seton Hill, and then she went on to Columbia to get her PhD. I mean, and this was in probably in the 30s that this was going on. So I, I guess I want to correct the misconception that uh, once they entered the religious life, um, that that was it as far as education or ambition. Just the opposite. And I saw that. And, you know, minus the habit, I could have, you know, I, I identified uh, with uh, what they... Um, what they did, they, uh, social justice was talked about in, in my high school, and it was talked about in college. Um, you know, college, Vietnam was going on. There was opposition to Vietnam, even on our small campus. Uh, you know, we joined protests and, and that sort of thing. Um, of course, we also had a walkout because we wanted no hours, <laughs> which meant we wanted no curfew. <laughs> For the seniors, <laughs> so I mean, those were the two extremes that you know the interest in at college. But I am very grateful to my parents for the opportunities uh, that they gave me uh, and my siblings uh, for education. So, fun fact: every member of the current Ohio Supreme Court is Catholic right now. So, fun fact: not drawing any judgment, but you know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> when did you decide to be a lawyer? Uh, well, I, I, I was in sixth grade, I remember, and uh, we had panel discussions, and there was a, a, a little uh, like current event a newspaper that came out once a week, and, and you read it, and you know, you had to present, different students had to, you know, four students had to present, um, you know, what was in the article, and then have a discussion, you know, w you know question. Um, and uh, I was on a panel, uh, and the issue was taxation. Uh, and I, I can't remember the context of the article, but there was the a statement that one of my classmates made that, uh, Older people and you know people people without children should not have to pay school taxes, 
Now, I'm in a Catholic school, and they're not getting any, you know, taxes. I didn't really realize that or even think about that. But I remember my response was, wait a second, everybody in society benefits if you're educated. And these people are ben benefiting by children being educated and going on and staying in the community. My sixth grade teacher said, you ought to be a lawyer. <laughs> and and um, so that's when, the, the, I mean, the kernel of, of uh, um, thinking about it. Uh, and then, um, you know, I, I tell this story, and law school deans shudder when I say this, uh, that I had graduated from college. Um, I went on to work on a master's in teaching. Uh, I got through my a student teaching experience. I only had my thesis left to do, and I decided I did not like children well enough to teach. <laughs> <laughs> and I, thousands of children have benefited from that decision, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you. Um, so, you know, I, I, that gets me, you know, a year, year and a half out of uh, uh, college. Um, uh, oh, I guess a year, or, I, I take that back, right after college, I worked for a year for a financial services company in their management training program. Did very well there, hated it. <laughs> so I, I went back to school, and, and I'm going to be a teacher. That was in my mind. And so, you know, we know how that worked out. And so, you know, I had to make up my mind, what do I want to do? And my grandparents wanted to go to Ireland for like their umpteenth time, but they were too old to rent a car, so they needed a driver. So eight weeks in the summer, I just drove around <laughs> Ireland and you know had a had a very good time. And um, so then I, you know, still I had to think about what I wanted to do, <clears throat> and um, you know I kept going back to being a lawyer, uh, and, and so I. I, I was student, or not student, teacher, substitute teaching during the day. Uh, I was waiting tables at the Brown Derby in the Cle near the Cleveland Airport in the evening, um, and that was that an education. God's work. Yeah, that was an education <laughs> in and of itself. Um, and so, you know, I had, uh, it, you know, some money in in the bank, and I decided that I was either going to, I, I will apply to one law school. If I get into law school, I will go to law school. If I don't, I'm going to take all this money and bum around Europe for as long as it lasts and see what happens. Um, I got into law school. <laughs> and so that, that's you know, how, how uh, I ended up in law school. Um, and I really, I enjoyed law school. I mean, a lot of people say, oh my god, it was the worst thing, and you know, I, I hated the bar exam. But I, I enjoyed law so, school. Yeah, we're going to jump to your legal career. But before we do, I have to set up the frame for how this woman went through law school. I'll tell you a little bit about her. She started law school in 1977 when less than 20% of law school classes were female, unlike today where 50% of law school classes are women. She got married in law school, had two children in law school because, quote, I didn't want to have to interrupt my career with children. So. <laughs> So she's going through law school with two young children. No, no, I didn't have the second one until the day after I graduated. Yvette. Oh, I'm sorry. So, she, okay. I so, just spent two out of three years pregnant in <laughs> law school. That's all. And then after she has the kids, she has a private practice at home. But let's talk about how we go from a private practice at home with two toddlers to um, getting into Republican politics in Summit County and becoming a uh, probate magistrate judge in Summit County. Well, I w was practicing. Uh, the beauty was uh, the youngest was two and toilet trained so they could go to daycare, <laughs> and so that freed up the day. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I practiced in, in probate court on uh, several occasions. Uh, one was a trial in front of um, um, the head magistrate there, and um, there was a vacancy that occurred because uh, the woman that had that job, Mary Spicer, was elected to the Common Pleas Court. Um, and so uh, they, you know, cast a net for, and I was asked to apply by George Wirtz. I always give George the credit. Um, and he's still there, by the way, at, at probate court. Um, and he really advocated for me to get the job. I was hired uh, as a magistrate. Um, I spent almost nine years as a magistrate in probate court uh, doing, uh, you know, guardianships of both adults and children, um, uh, estates, of course, uh, involuntary commitments of the mentally ill. I'm 
set up, you know, courts at uh, all the mental um, mental wards the, uh, uh, in the county, um, and uh, you know all all the other stuff, name changes, all the stuff that that comes to you, and in probate court, except for the adoptions, I did all the adoptions uh, in the county. Um, which were the joyous occasions, but the other occasions I just described, people are in turmoil, and you got to help them solve problems. And that's the role of a judge, is to be a problem solver. And sometimes, you know, I, you, you don't have to necessarily look at the law to solve the problem. Uh, you can get compromise, uh, you know, in the parties, um, and. And that's the way I approached my job. And I was very successful at, at doing that. And um, so anyway, the, the, in Summit County, the politics, the Republican Party was run by Alex Arshinkoff, God rest his soul. And he was, uh, he was you know, one of a kind. Uh, and uh, as a magistrate, uh, you know, they had this system uh, that you had to run if you wanted to be a judge you know, a common police court judge or an appellate judge, you had to run uh, a, a, and, you know, as a obviously Republican and um, challenge, you know, a sitting judge or, or the opponent for an open seat. Um, and that was, you paid your dues that way. And, and so I did. Uh, and uh, lost elections, um, but you know, people were wondering why I wasn't, you know, tearing my hair out because, you know, I worked hard, you know, on the campaigns, but I knew that this was the system in Summit County uh, in order to be recommended to the uh, governor uh, for, uh, you know, position on the Court of Common Pleas, which is what I wanted to do, and lo and behold, um, uh, Judge Bayer retired, and. Uh, my name was sent down along with two others, and, and uh, Governor Voinovich appointed me to the court, the Common Pleas Court. Uh, another place to solve uh, to problem solve, the Common Pleas Court. You know, very rarely, if ever, uh, does anybody want to be in Common Pleas Court. You know, you, you don't have you have a literally a Some captive audience, yeah. a captive audience, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I I really rolled up my sleeves and, and uh, you know, tried to look, well, first of all, be thoroughly familiar with the cases that I was hearing in pretrials uh, and try and uh, work out compromises, settlements. And uh, I was very successful. I think I went like three or four months without a trial because I had settled everything, including the criminal cases. Um, so it was, uh, I liked doing that. I, I, I did. I, I liked presiding over trials. I thought it was just a wonderful uh, job and a job that I would thought that I would have for the rest of my career. Uh, because, you know, I had in my mind, I'm going to be a magistrate, then I'm going to be a, a you know, common pleas court judge. Um, so then I, I had to stand for election because, uh, you know, you have to run the, the next general election, which was two years after I had been appointed. Uh, and I won uh, by, I think, almost 70% of the vote uh, to, re, you know, have my seat on the, uh, uh, on the court. Uh, and then fast forward to January, around, I, I believe it was, um, they were looking to replace the prosecuting attorney in Summit County because that a gentleman had been elected to the Ninth District Court of Appeals. And the prosecuting attorney was one of the most important jobs in Summit County because it was one of the few prosecuting attorney offices in the state, I think there were only six at the time, that ran the Child Support Enforcement Agency. And you know, there's only one institution that affects more children than uh, CS, you know, uh, CS, or excuse me, uh, Child Support Enforcement Agency, uh, and that's our school system. So that tells you, you know, how elevated and how many lives this touched. Um, but so anyway, uh, there were some gentlemen who were wanted the job, and I felt, from my vantage point, that they shouldn't have the job. Uh, and I went to uh, the Republican, Alex. Arshikov, and I said, I will resign from being a judge if I get appointed to be the county prosecutor. He 
probably wanted to take me to one of those mental health institutions <laughs> that I had presided over. Um, but he was elated, you know, that that, that, that would happen. Uh, I Actually, I, I talked to all my fellow members of the judiciary one at a time to let them know. Um, and I remember one of them said, why do you want to work that hard? Uh, and so, so anyway, I get appointed. And um, I knew that the, uh, the Children's Defense Fund had come into Ohio and raided all of the uh, agencies in every county, uh, all of the child support enforcement agencies in every county. And Summit County was 87th out of 88 for effectiveness and you know, living up to what their duties and responsibilities are. Um, and um, I'm very proud that two years later we were nominated for two national awards because of the improvement in the Child Support Enforcement Agency. That was not, okay, the only thing I did was hire the right people, get rid of the people that needed to get rid of, the director who was running a rug cleaning business out of his office. Um, I kid you not, I kid you not. Um, and uh, put the right people in, and I did. I put managers in there, I, I, people who know, you know, and wanted to be public servants. And that's the overarching, you know, theme here. You want to be a public servant. And uh, that, I think, is probably the most important title that I have had over all these years in my career, because it describes every position I've had. Uh, and that's, um, you know, that, that's uh, important to me. So for those of you taking notes, the key to success as a leader is you hire good people and get out of their way. Mm -hmm. You let them do what they do. Um, I've, I've, <laughs> that I've always is the key, done that, right? I, and, I did that in the Child Support Enforcement Agency, in the, um, uh, you know, in the uh, Civil Division, the Criminal Division. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we were a very successful office. Um, and then um, they governor came knocking. Came they, they came knocking on the mm -hmm. door for Lieutenant Governor. There were some people that they were considering. They wondered if I would be interested. You know, I had the right pedigree. You know, it's like they were a show dog. They, you know, I, I was <laughs> Northeast Ohio. I was a woman, criminal justice, uh, the judiciary, you know, and, and uh, I you was You had an Catholic. engaging personality. Oh, <laughs> Irish Catholic with a name like O'Connor, uh, you know. Um, funny story about that. A friend of mine at the time, uh, he and his wife went over to Ireland and they were wearing a Taft O'Connor shirt over in Ireland. And people came up to him and said, we know who O'Connor is, but who the hell's Taft? <laughs> <laughs> I told Bob that. Um, Did he laugh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, it, it worked out. I became lieutenant governor. I needed a real job because mm -hmm. lieutenant governor at the time had really no statutory duties. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I, you know, I was the director of the Department of Public Safety. Most important job, one of the most important jobs that I've ever had. Uh, I was director uh, at the time of 9-11. Mm -hmm. So I was the liaison with Washington uh, and uh, all of our emergency management uh, people in the state, every county has an emergency management agency. We had a wonderful emergency management state um, agency, uh, and uh, Dale Shipley was the leader. And uh, we were in such good shape compared to the other states because of the structure we had in Ohio and the people that were in those places. And that was uh, that was a really daunting and you know, gut-wrenching experience. I was on the ground at, uh, at the World Trade Center one week to the day after the um, train, or the, excuse me, the planes had uh, you know, uh, taken them down. And um, we had a search and rescue team from Ohio, specially trained uh, members of the safety forces, emergency management forces from all over the state, came together uh, the next day and they were in New York City and they were looking for survivors. That was what they did, and they didn't find any. Mm -hmm. And you know, here I am a week later, and they hadn't found any uh, live, survi well, live survivors, that's redundant, but no survivors. And they were just, it, it was, I'm not gonna say they were demoralized, but it, they, were, they were very um, affected by that. Um, so I show up with some other members of uh, the Ohio cabinet, 
uh, the attor attorney, no, the adjutant general was with me, and I forget who else. But we brought just boxes of Grater's ice cream and Cheryl's cookies and an Ohio flag and um, you know all this you know, stuff from Ohio because they were set up at the Javits Center. And they were on cots, and they had, you know, cordoned off, but, you know, that's what they were doing. Um, and then they'd go out all day and, and work, you know, amongst the rubble. Um, but the most important thing was I brought letters from their families. I still, I still get choked up. That was unbelievable, the joy yeah. that that brought them. It was... Uh, Again, I still get checked up over. So let's, we've got, we've got uh, probably about 10 or more minutes left before we have to go to questions. So I want to talk about your, um, your term as the first female Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. And we know now how you got there. You all have a sense of the kind of woman uh, and leader that she is and how she took the bench. And so a couple of things that are remarkable. Um, about when you took the bench. You immediately got to work. You had been an associate justice. You get elected as chief justice in 2010. You then call somebody and say, you better get up, take this appointment to the court. <laughs> and so literally yeah. called, and me at eight. She called me at eight in the morning. I sat straight up. She was up, still like. in bed. She was I know, still I, was. In bed. I didn't have yeah. a job. Yeah. So she's like, <laughs> she's like, <laughs> This is Maureen O'Connor. I'll never forget that call. But anyway, so as soon as you get elected as Chief Justice, you immediately start to work. And one of the, following the George Floyd murder, she wrote this, this fabulous article um, that kind of went viral across the state and in the country. But the one line that I always remember, which is kind of how you led as a Chief Justice, you quoted um, President Kennedy in talking about why black people were um, having protests downtown Columbus and it defaced the Supreme Court and how their views of justice um, were different than those who were not black. And you quoted um, President Kennedy and you said, life is not fair, but our government must be. And that really is how you have lived your public service. And so you get elected as chief justice, you immediately go about getting judges for the judges and retired judges in this room a pay raise. And that took a lot, a lot of shoe leather convincing Governor Kasich and then working with the leaders of the General Assembly. You started an access to justice commission, you worked on criminal justice reform. Um, you were so focused on making sure that the system, the judicial system in Ohio, from the time you started as chief to your last month, talking about bail bonds and fees and how you know bail had become a debtor's prison. Right. And it seems now that that was informed probably by a lot of the Catholic education, social justice. But talk about the goals you wanted to accomplish as chief justice and what you feel like you left undone. Uh, fines, fees, and bail is a, is a great example. I co-chaired a national uh, commission on that. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to see, you know, what's our state doing? Uh, you know, here I am advocating across the country, and, you know, there was many systems as there are states, but, you know, let's focus and see what Ohio is doing. Uh, and I wanted, uh, I wanted this to be the, the model, that the first thing you do as a judge is presume that you're going to release without bond. You know, personal recognizant, uh, if there has to be some conditions, maybe an ankle bracelet or, you know, some other restrictions, drug testing, you know, et cetera. You've got a whole box of tools you can use. But you don't use cash because cash doesn't keep you safe, okay? Uh, cash doesn't keep society safe. And, and it's just a burden on people who don't have it, and they sit in jail, uh, and they sit. And it costs the taxpayers, and it's a stupid system, stupid. So then, uh, you know, the next thing is, okay, you're gonna look at, at a reasonable bond. If, if it's not gonna be personal recognizance, you look at a reasonable bond. What is it gonna take to get this person back to court? Well, you know, most of the people come back to court uh, and it's not because they posted $250, which, by the way, they had to scrape together God knows how, or $500 or whatever. Um, uh, you know, they come back to court because they really don't have a choice. Uh, if they don't come back to court, it's not because they're 
intentionally going to abscond, you know, it's they're horrible schedule managers. They don't have a, you know, a, a calendar. They don't have a pocket calendar that, oh, I've got a court date right next to my, you know, salon appointment. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's not the way it, it works. So, you know, we have a system now in many of the jurisdictions where you get, uh, you know, a telephone reminder, uh, just like you do, if, you know, I just got one from my dentist, which I have to go to tomorrow. You know, are you going to be up here? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. So, you know, these are the type of things that are employed, and that has uh, really helped the failure uh, to appear numbers uh, to decline. And it's, you know, it's, it's just smart. It's just smart. Um, so, But the legislature wasn't happy, so they put something on the ballot. Oh, um, that was after, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that was after the DuBose case, which was totally distorted. Um, totally Tell everybody distorted. What that is. It was a, a case where uh, you know there was a there was a murder, and uh, they had someone that they you know the the defendant he was arrested. Um, they put like a million five on them maybe to begin with, and um, you know the. the it wasn't the type of, of uh, defendant that was going to abscond, let's, let's put it that way. Um, and there's no way they could make the, that kind of a bond. Um, you know, there's plenty of very dangerous people that could make that kind of a bond, but this guy, you know, couldn't. Um, the, the, I think if, if my memory's correct, it was a drug deal gone bad, mm -hmm. and um, uh, this guy you know, probably was guilty. Uh, you know, and I think that he ended up being obviously convicted. Um, but his bond was reduced when he got to the common pleas court, you know, from a million five to 500,000. Uh, and there was this uproar. Well, he couldn't make 500,000 either. So, you know, he was sitting in jail. And there was this uproar that this, you know, the judge did the wrong thing, et cetera. It, you know, it comes up to the Supreme Court. We hear the case. And then, in a very, I think, scholarly opinion, Justice Melody Stewart lays out the purposes of bond, which is pretty much what I just told you. Um, never was it said that you know we won't, you know, use high bonds mm -hmm. or whatever it means uh, to keep society safe. But it recognized the constitutional right of a defendant to be innocent until you know proven guilty. And uh, you know, under those circumstances, for the vast majority of defendants, they don't need to have a million dollar bond. So, uh, or you know, a, a bond that they can't make. Uh, so that was the, the crux of the opinion. And um, that was uh, weaponized uh, during the campaigns of uh, the Supreme Court justices uh, in 22. And uh, it was also then, uh, constitutional amendment mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that a judge has to hear, has to consider public safety when they're setting a bond. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, that's, that, was the, mm -hmm. that was the constitutional amendment we have now. Isn't that nice? Is it frustrating now that it seems like, at least in Ohio right now, that the court, you know, applies the constitution or as in redistricting, there's a constitutional amendment passed. Um, the legislature ignores it, and then when they're unhappy with it, they try to pass a law to override the court's authority. Is that frustrating for you as you leave the court? It, no, because it's not unique. I mean, it's not, uh, first of all, I don't take anything personally. I, I never have. And you can't do that if you're in public office. You just can't take things personally. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I knew what they were doing, and then they have this constitutional amendment, and at the same time, they've appealed the uh, redistricting case to the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, just keeping this redistricting buzz going is what was, uh, you know, what was happening there. And, um, uh, you know, yeah, it's frustrating, but they're, they're, what can I do about it? You know, well, now that I'm retired, um, <laughs> you know, I can be involved uh, with, uh, you know, uh, efforts to maybe pass another constitutional mm -hmm. amendment. And this time, the constitutional amendment 
uh, depoliticizes the uh, redistricting commission. Mm -hmm. There are would be no elected officials on the redistricting commission uh, in an ideal yes. format. And other states have done it and done it successfully. And uh, you know, Arizona, um, Iowa, uh, Michigan come to mind. You know, Colorado, uh, Colorado uh, California. You know, just a, a lot of. Well, I was just trying to do the conservative <laughs> states. You know, just to make a point. Anyway, um, I don't so, believe we're conservative, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, no, no. I mean, Iowa, Arizona. Come on. Uh, so anyway. Um, you know, if they can do it, we can do it, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's going to take a constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very complicated thing to get off the ground, very time consuming, very costly, and time will tell whether that happens. Um, but it's something that I'm spending time on now with a core group of uh, people. We're talking about it um, very seriously. Uh, and um, uh, you know, networking uh, to a certain extent, and and we're going to see where it goes because uh, even though here we are in 23, you know, early 23, you got to get cracking on it if it's going to be on the ballot in November. You got a lot of, of signatures to get. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to move into questions from our live stream and in person audiences. Uh, and if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. Um, Jane. So I do have one question that was submitted ahead from Albin Bell. Do you think America is seeing a decline of constitutional law and order? America is seeing a decline of constitutional law and order. I hope not. I, you know, there's these high profile uh, incidences that happen in our country. Um, I'm gonna start out by saying most Americans do not know what the Constitution contains. And, and I think that's the failing of our uh, education system. And I think that uh, there should be some effort to familiarize people with the fact that there's a United States Constitution and there's an Ohio Constitution and, you know, the d difference, you know, where the state constitution offering more protection. Um, and so, you know, we, we talk, people talk about, well, that's not constitutional or I've got a right to do that or whatever. They don't know, you know that. So, but so is it declining? I don't know that it was ever at the point where, you know, everybody was had a faith in it and and believed in it and and, uh, you know, now we have acts of violence by public servants against you know unarmed individuals and who die and and we have, you know, there's about a hundred different constitutional rights being violated right there, right there. And, and it's on, on video and it's on, you know, uh, and, and so how do people have faith uh, in our institutions when we see members of our institutions uh, murdering people? Yeah. Uh, it, that's hard, that's hard. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the courts, thank, Thankfully, the courts have the highest level of confidence uh, that the Americans, uh, you know, surveyed. This is a, just a recent survey, a survey by the National Center for State Courts. But the level that it is now in, in confidence is a decline from where it was just a year ago. Yeah. So I'm worried about that. I'm very worried about that. Yeah. What are we going to do to restore it? We, uh, yep. anyone who has a question, please Judge come on Beatty. up and, and we'll, we'll go back and forth. So. What's your perspective of colleges and universities who are, quote unquote, protecting students and the apparent curtailment of free thought and free speech on campuses? They're doing what to students? They're curtailing f f uh, free, free thought, um, protecting their students from uh, different opinions. Oh, from hearing divert different points of views, conservative and liberal views on, on college campuses. Oh, well, I mean, that's, 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 crazy. that's not education. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. That is just not education. Judge Beatty Blunt. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, Chief Justice, thank you so much. Yvette, thank you so much. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with you, particularly anyone who has to run for election as a judge will tell anyone here that half of our campaign is educating people 
about the judicial system. Mm -hmm. um, but so he, Chief Justice, you know, if you go in certain circles, there are people who think everyone just lift up the jail and throw everybody under it, right? And then on the other side, you have people that say no one should ever go to jail mm -hmm. or prison. Um, not, and the person that thinks no one should go to jail um, probably hasn't talked to a murder victim's family. And someone who thinks that everyone should go to jail has probably never talked to someone who has um, overcome an addiction and done the work to become a productive citizen. And so my question, Chief Justice, is how do we get people out of their bubbles to see the other side and, and possibly get to the middle? I think conversations. I think that it, it, that has to be a purposeful education uh, of people. If someone is, you know, if some group or, or, uh, is advocating, as you said, let's throw everybody in jail and, and uh, um, invite yourself to be a speaker. Uh, there. I think it's important for judges especially to go out and speak about the system and speak about the tools that have been developed, specialized dockets, talk about treatment, talk about addiction, talk about what happens to a person's brain when they're addicted and what happens when they get clean and how some people have to take methadone for the rest of their lives but you know the, that's, that's okay. Um, you know, all these things that we as judges know go on and it is a response to people who are, quote, breaking the law. Um, and, you know, if they're, uh, you hit them with the, the details of, uh, you know, this is draining your tax dollars. It could go, you know, for, uh, you know, better use. There, there's a whole host of arguments. But judges need to get off the bench and out into the public and speak at rotaries, uh, you know, um, whatever, clubs that, that are out there, uh, church organizations, offer up your speaking, you know, and, and you will be asked to do it. And since this is an education forum, one of the things you started was votes count or oh, judicialvotescount.org. Yeah, people need to spend time. Don't fall for just the 30 second sound bite. Investigate who's running. Judge Beatty Blunt always says this the most important time to know who your judge yeah, is is I not see. when you're standing in front of them. Yeah, see, it's when on you're election day. In front of a judge, it's too late <laughs> so. to care who the judge is. You have to care at the ballot box. Yeah, yeah. The, the Ohio State Bar Association <laughs> took over that. That's something that I started, judicialvotescount.org and now it is um, with the Ohio State Bar Association. The legislature has funded it, uh, you know, for uh, the election cycle. Uh, so they're going to be, you know, taking it on, or have taken it on, and I am very grateful that they did, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Looper? The prior questioner and another judge on the <laughs> appeals court bench are products of single sex education in high school. And I think it truly prepared both of them uh, to be on the appeals court of Franklin County. If indeed a constitutional amendment is drawn up to be voted on by the people in 2024, what will it say and how will you educate people as to its importance to vote on? Well, I can't tell you what it's gonna say because the drafters haven't gotten together and figured it out and it's a very complicated thing to do because if there's one thing you need to do is consider all the angles, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, all of the angles and clarity. You know, that is the essence of what we need in our Constitution, clarity. Not limitations, but clarity. And um, I know that, but I can't tell you right now if you gave me a, a you know, piece of paper and a pen that I could draft it, because it will take a lot of very smart people coming together to do this, and it will be done. Um, and, uh, you know, resources uh, and people volunteering. Uh, what's going to be necessary. So all of you in this room, keep in mind that you may be asked to uh, circulate petitions and, uh, you know, certainly vote. Uh, maybe, you know, educate uh, all your friends and coworkers, et cetera, uh, if it, uh, you know, comes about, or I should say when it comes about. 
um, because that's how, I mean, you gotta start a buzz about this. And I think that, uh, you know, it, the buzz about redistricting, you say redistricting, you have to have been under a rock in Ohio if you don't know what the redistricting uh, was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fight over redistricting. When the chief says clarity, she means look for loopholes. Because if there's any <laughs> loophole in the language, it's yeah. going to be exploited. Yeah. Uh, this constitutional amendment they passed in 2015, it said should, it should have said shall. I mean, you've got to you've got to always be thinking about any way for politicians, assuming they're on. There's not an independent commission that they can um, right, flout right. the will of the people. And and the the um, constitutional amendments that were passed in 15 and 18 were drafted by the legislature. Big mistake. Not not <laughs> a, a, a citizens group or you know it was by the legislature. Yeah. Jane? I have a couple questions, one from Kathy Fox and, and an, another person here that they're basically addressing the um, bipartisan, the need for bipartisanship and the use of divisive and diverse topics to win elections. Any thoughts on our current state of the political parties? They use what sells. Yeah. You know, that's basically, you know, the polls are done, uh, you know, interest groups are, are vetted and, and uh, you know, they, if there's a hot topic, uh, that will become uh, the campaign, uh, you know, capture the campaign. And it, many times the, uh, the, the candidate can direct the focus of the people uh, for the campaign by creating the issues or identifying the issues um, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, redistricting is going to be a big thing. Um, it, you know, already has been a big thing. But, um, you know, the, the man who was the genius behind the redistricting was a guy by the name of Tom Ho Hoffler, Loffler, so Loffeller, something like that. Terry, who was it? Do you remember? Hoffler. Hoffler. Yeah. Um, and this is a famous quote. Uh, no longer will uh, people pick the politicians, politicians will pick the people. And that's what redistricting is all about. And he said, and there's, there's a clip on YouTube, um, here's the beauty of redistricting, you know, and he said the people will no longer pick the politician, the politicians will pick the people. And that, in a nutshell, is redistricting. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, thank you both for your very informative uh, comments, and uh, in particular, uh, Justice O'Connor. Um, my name is Brian Urbanski, and I, uh, I'm an affordable housing provider, and my wife and I have established a, uh, a foundation, the Aubrey Affordable Housing Foundation, or a 501c3, and we are one of very few uh, housing providers in the Central Ohio area that are friendly to justice-involved individuals, people coming home from being incarcerated. And I'd like to hear both of your opinions. I, I greatly appreciate the, the, the work that you've done uh, in this arena and, and trying to work with people in more fair and just uh, situations. But as a community, what can we do for the folks that are coming back out of the system that don't have a, a community that's willing to provide housing for them and, and provide uh, employment opportunities. What can we do as a community to be more welcoming to help get those folks back on track so we can start lowering the recidivism rate in Ohio? We have 20,000 people coming back to, coming home every single year, and that, that's a lot of folks, and a lot of them, unfortunately, don't have the support to stay out of the system. Exactly, the support system is missing. If they had a support system to begin with, they might not have chosen that path. So, you know, that's a fact. Um, affordable housing, God bless you for doing, for doing that. We need more of that. And, and um, but you know the, the hue and cry is not in my neighborhood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that has to be overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an issue for the city, you know, city leaders uh, to be uh, um, forthcoming and supporting that. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, there's, if I had the answer of, you know, how can we create more jobs well, in this environment if they are not hired, quite frankly, I don't think it's their fault. I think that, you know, it, it's the person doing the hiring because everybody, you know, needs people, mm -hmm. you know, especially ground level 
you know, people um, that are doing, you know, uh, you want a fair, uh, you know, pay for a day's work, absolutely. You don't want them taken advantage of. Uh, and uh, if that, you know, the, the, a group of businesses could appreciate that and, uh, you know, make a commitment to hire uh, the folks, you know, that's, that's a place to start. Um, and, uh, you know, there's organizations, you know, that, that, you know, the Rotaries, and I keep saying the Rotaries, but there's the Lions Club, there's all kinds. But the Rotary is, you know, a lot of local business people. Go talk to them. Volunteer to be their speaker. Talk about what you do and what the shortage is and what's needed. And challenge them in a nice way that, you know, if you have, a, if you can be a solution for just one, just one, if you need a worker just for, you know, one, maybe two, you know, ask them to do it face to face. That's my advice. Great. Thank you very much. Ms. Emily? Thank you so much for sharing some of your history and your story. Um, one of the questions that I had is, uh, you know, I, I work with women who are trying to get elected to office at the Matriots, and, um, and it sounded like throughout your history, you selected opportunities that spoke to you, that were meaningful to you, and yet you turned around and also helped the Honorable Brown get uh, selected to the court. So how do we help women, specifically women, no offense, gentlemen, specifically women identify those opportunities where they'll be able to serve and, and solve problems, and how do we help others who are in the role reach back and let, lift others up? What can we do better? Well, I think it's you know, very important for women who have attained whatever level uh, you know, of elected office, and not just the judiciary, but elected office, to reach back and, you know, with a helping hand and, and you know, bring someone along. Um, you know, identify someone on your staff uh, that you, know, you think would be you know, su suited with mentoring, you know, a, a added mentoring, and that person could uh, you know, be whatever you know, the position is. Um, positions of leadership are not always elected positions of leadership, so there's you know, opportunities to grow into a role uh, so to speak, with an institution. Um, and it's important for people who, as I said, have attained the, the position mm -hmm. uh, to uh, remember uh, what it was like. Uh, you know, I, I, I speak to, I, I can't tell you how many school groups, you know, in my career, um, and uh, let them know, and I think one of the things is important, I don't really take it as a big deal that I'm the first woman Chief Justice, uh, but other people do. And it's a symbol or uh, you know, something for both girls and boys to recognize that you know, women can do, you know, they're smart and they're, you know, they can attain and uh, they can lead. Um, and that's what my role as the first woman Chief Justice, um, I hope, uh, um, emanates to, you know, to the kids that I talk to, you know, grade school, high school, and college. Remember what Madeleine Albright said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we, w we wish we had more time, but now we're going to turn it uh, back over to Joelle Kuzman for concluding remarks. Well, I hope that you found today's program as inspiring as I did and that you got a little bit of an insight as to why Justice O'Connor has been referred to as an independent voice on Ohio's Supreme Court. Thank you to today's forum partner, the Matriots. Thank you also to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for its support. Thank you to our virtual seat patrons and to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting our live stream. And our very special appreciation to today's speakers, Justice Maureen O'Connor and our host, Yvette McGee-Brown. Let's give them a round of applause. Please make plans now to attend next Wednesday's forum here at the Grange Audubon Center. We'll be hosting a panel of distinguished Columbus religious leaders for a discussion on the role of religion in Central Ohio, led by our friend and former anchor, Jerry Revish. Lastly, 
thank all of you. We could not do this without you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us.